Okay, we are recording now. I apologize. Okay, so we missed the uh, intro, but I think that'll be it. So do you see the, uh, sorry, that was distracting. This little guy, if you can see my cursor, maybe I can get a pointer. Here we go. There, this little guy is a um, barber pole worm. So the, they are in there, they're latching on and they're drinking the blood. They like make a little hole and when it bleeds it, they suck up the blood. So we're gonna look at, first we're gonna talk about gastrointestinal parasites, the ones that are mostly in the stomach or the intestines. And on this chart circled here are all the eggs that were, you would look for if you were doing a fecal sample. You can see how similar these all look. So it's very hard to tell them apart in a fecal sample uh, without special dyeing, uh, knowing how to, to dye them. So the one we're going to talk about first is homunculus contortus. That's this one uh, that's kind of gray there in the middle or on the uh, left, sorry. And that's the one we were just looking at. So we'll take a look at that. The good news is most of these um, intestinal parasites have a very direct life cycle. So the eggs hatch in the manure of an infected sheep or goat, then the larva goes through a few molts. Uh, this is out on your pasture and you can't see them, but they're out there. And then they become infective larva, which are then eaten by another sheep or goat. And then inside the sheep or goat, those larva mature and then they breed and produce eggs. So they're breeding and producing the eggs in the sheep or goat. And then they are poop them out on the pasture. They hatch, they molt and they get eaten again. So it's, um, there's nothing in between, no, no other species that they have to go through. The eggs in the larva can tolerate cold temperatures <clears throat> and some even over winter on the pasture. And it tends to be a pasture and barnyard problem, especially if the pasture is small and damp, which these days, even with a big pasture with all the moisture we've had, it's a big challenge. Um, they don't generally pick up many larvae in the barn because they aren't normally eating off the ground for one thing and the ammonia gas from the bedding or the bedded pack uh, discourages their survival. And so you want your animals eating out of a feeder if possible. I will say that when you bring animals into the barn, like when we wean our lambs and they already have a fairly high egg count, uh, it does take a while for that to go down. It doesn't just, they don't all disappear. In other words, they just stop getting reinfected which is a good thing. So here's our barber pole worm. And this is the one right here. This is a barber pole in case you're too young to even know what a barber pole is. So it's like a candy cane, right? It's striped. That's the blood in there that you can see. And this is the, the tip. And it has like a little um, sharp spot there that bites into the abomasum lining. And then when they bleed, they suck up the blood. And you wouldn't think a little worm could make that much difference, but there's so many of them that can actually uh, take a lot of the blood. So it was originally a parasite of warm climates, but it's spread to the Northeast. I don't know if that's a result of climate change or just us moving our animals around. And uh, short generation time, so it, it reproduces quickly, makes a lot of eggs, and they can consume, consume 0.05 mLs of blood per day, which again, doesn't sound like much till you multiply that times 10,000 or 100,000. And you realize that that's a lot of blood and uh, could really make an animal feel very weak and even die. So they can infest and kill a host in four weeks. And the hard part is you probably won't know it's happening when it's happening. So we'll talk about that right now. Betsy? Yes. Um, if I can point out one thing, that that's a female worm there. The, the male uh -huh. worm all red. The female worm is red and white because the white there is her ovaries. <laughs> In case you're looking at barber pole worms and you want to sort them by sex. Um, so clinical signs of the barber worm infection are not diarrhea, right? So therefore, it's not that easy to tell that they have an infection. And they can be going along looking just fine and they're becoming very anemic. So how are we gonna figure that out? One way is to look at their mucous membranes, which you can see a person pulling down the lower eyelid and looking, and that one's white like a piece of paper. That's very bad. Should be nice and pink, almost red in there. 
So that's one way to tell, and that's the FAMACHA system, which we'll talk more about uh, later in the talk. And sometimes they develop bottle jaw. So if you look at the uh, hair lamb on the bottom, it's got a uh, fluid that's accumulated under the chin, and that, that little pouch is all soft and jiggly if you touch it. And um, that's because they're losing protein uh, and the fluid is leaking where the um, uh, barber pole worms are sucking away in the abomasum. So if you see barber, if you see a bottle jaw and or pale mucous membranes, then you're likely to have a barber pole infection. And the problem is the animal may not really show that they're not feeling well, and they may not get bottle jaw. So you need to have a way to check them, which is the purpose of the FAMACHA. So we'll talk more about that later, but homuncus is one of the few worms that is likely to actually kill an animal. So you wanna be on top of that one. We'll talk about other ways to control it as well. The brown stomach worm, um, that used to be considered the most serious parasite of the sheep in cooler climates before the homuncus came along. And this one develops in the gastric glands of the stomach or what we call the true stomach in a ruminant or the abomasum and destroys the glands as they grow. So because of that, you know, they're not gonna digest their food correctly and that makes it their nutrient utilization and absorption not so hot. And so they might not look as good. So they usually have diarrhea, they don't eat as well, they have some weight loss, their hair coat might look rough, that sort of thing. Uh, but they do tend to have diarrhea in this case. And there's other strong giles, I don't know if, um, so all of these worms disrupt digestion and absorption of nutrients uh, by damaging those gastric glands in the abomasum or by damaging the lining of the abomasum or the small intestines. But the clinical signs are fairly obvious, unlike the barber pole worm. They have diarrhea, uh, they have weight loss and the rough hair coat we were just talking about. And so there's a couple different ones listed there, which I won't try to murder their names, but you can see their, their eggs over here on the lower corner all look very similar. And they, there's the homuncus contortus barber pole worm. And here's the others. So it's a little tricky to tell from the fecal sample what you got. And there's one other one, uh, nematodorus, uh, uh, that's a larger egg, which is a little easier to recognize. Don't see that very often, but otherwise they're pretty indistinguishable. Did you wanna say something, Todd? Well, I was gonna say that it isn't that they're hard to tell apart, it's that they're impossible to tell apart. <laughs> chart, the only reason they look different is because a different stain happened to be used on them. But in order to actually identify these worms, a parasitologist actually has to culture them, or there's a few other things we can do. Um, some of them will, will, will fluoresce in certain kinds of stain, and some of them won't. Um, but basically, you can't really tell those eggs apart. So you can get an, an egg count, but you don't really know which it is. You have right. other signs to tell what it is. Uh -huh, correct. So there's strongyloides, which there's been some, some of that showing up this year. And uh, it's also sometimes called the threadworm or the pinworm, but it's not like the pinworms that your kids might have, might have had when they were young or not the cat and dog species that infects people. Um, and they have a complicated life cycle and they're pretty well evolved. They can produce sexually or asexually. And they can be ingested from the manure in the pasture or from the dam's milk if the larva migrate to her udder. They can even get in through the skin and that little hairline right above the hoof. Especially in muddy infected pastures, like around you know, where you go in and out of the barn or around the water, water trough, those kind of places where animals are stepping down in the mud and maybe poking themselves with a, a piece of gravel or something that's in the... Uh, mud and then these little critters can get in there. And they can even get in there prenatally if the larvae have migrated to the placenta. So they're pretty bad guys. They are sensitive to the cold and the dryness, uh, but the symptoms are diarrhea. Again, if there's enough damage to the in internal uh, or the intestinal mucosa, uh, they can die. Although I think that's fairly unusual because people would notice they were not feeling good first. And if their lungs are infected by the larva, they might be coughing and they might get a secondary pneumonia as well. 
Um, there is a lungworm that also causes coughing. So just be aware that they're both out there. And um, I didn't, haven't seen this, but it does, um, it does happen, seems to happen in certain years and not others. Yep, Betsy, I, I know this year on almost all the farms I've been on, we've had strongyloides because conditions have been wet and it's getting, been getting into the hair, hairline. And it's an egg that's smaller than the strongyle egg, so you can tell it apart when you look under a microscope. It's, mm -hmm. it's smaller than them. I assume it's probably susceptible to about the same dewormers, though. Yes, particularly the ivermectin family. So we're going to talk about tapeworms. Now, tapeworms, the only thing I like about tapeworms is they're one of the few worms you can actually see in the manure. And um, you can see they look a lot like linguini or fettuccine. <laughs> and uh, in the, when you see them in the worm, in, or you see one in the manure, they actually look like pieces of rice. And they're very white, so they stand out in the manure. Um, and you usually see it in the, the lambs because it's something they sort of uh, get an immunity to after a while. And um, I have lambs born in April, May, and I tend to see tapeworm in the eggs around the middle of July, uh, occasionally earlier, um, but they get over it generally on their own. Occasionally you can have problems with it if they get a really severe infestation, but they live in the small intestine and they pass out through the feces and you can see them. The eggs are eaten by a pasture mite. Now you didn't even know there were mites on your pasture probably that are eating these things, but they're out there. The egg hatches uh, in the mite and the mite is eaten by the sheep or goat. Um, I've never seen a pasture mite in person, but I know they're out there and they do um, are in this life cycle of the tapeworms. So again, uh, you don't usually need to treat for them, especially if you're vaccinating your lambs. Um, but they, I have seen at least one farm where they were causing a problem, uh, not the eggs, the worms themselves, but um, uh, they were, we did have lambs that were dying, and I think that's not related to the worm, but to uh, a clostridial infection related to having too many worms. So uh, let's, uh, these are lungworms that are circled here. We're going to talk about lungworms, and these are larvae. They aren't, you can't find their eggs in the fecal sample. Most of them are curly. These are three different types. I'm not sure which type I've had, I have had them at my farm and they tend to show up later, a little bit later in the fall. As a matter of fact, the ones I had really came to light on Christmas Eve, which I'm sure the vet didn't appreciate. But I had two ewes and a llama, I had a llama down actually with the lungworms. So let's take a look here at lungworms. They have an indirect cycle through a snail and you're gonna find that snails are really, um, uh, troublemakers in this whole uh, parasite thing. They seem to be working together a lot of times. So there's um, some of them go through the snail and there's one kind that is a direct life cycle. Uh, they can cause coughing and food in the lungs and lead to pneumonia. And I think this is this uh, curly one here is what I've seen in a fecal sample before, a very typical looking one. Uh, it's excreted as a larvae, not an egg. That's why you can only find the larva in the feces. And um, to be sure you wanna take the fecal sample right from the animal uh, because they can have little nematodes like this in the soil. So if you're taking one up off the ground, you gotta be a little careful not to confuse it with a soil nematode. But luckily they are also um, killed by the same things that get stomach worms and intestinal worms. But after my little experience of having that in the, around Christmas time, I did um, deworm all my sheep and goats in the fall for a year or two and confine them to the barn so that they wouldn't drop all the resistant worms out on the pasture. And now we know that doing all your sheep and goats at once is not a great idea. So I don't do it anymore, but that was to try to make sure I didn't have lungworm. Liver flukes. Now there's a couple different kinds of liver flukes and we'll talk about all the different kinds in a minute. They, they're, um, there are some farms in the Northeast that have acute and chronic liver fluke populations, and uh, they do require water <clears throat> or wet areas at least, and snails, those darn snails. Um, they can 
You can kill adult liver flukes with albendazole, which is also the trade name is Valbazin, or Ivermec Plus, and it's the Corsalon in the Ivermec Plus that uh, actually kills the flukes. So we'll talk about the different kinds here. And I, I had a really bad experience with the second one there, the deer fluke, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, if they have the indirect life cycle in the snail or a snail and an ant, or an ant as intermediate hosts, uh, you have to remember that any place there's snails, it's not a good place to put your sheep. And I did a, a bad thing and I fenced in the corner of the woods down in a wet area, trying to give the sheep some shade because they couldn't come back to the barn. And I think as a result, I exposed them to a lot of snails that were, you know, under the woods, it stays pretty damp in the morning or along the hedgerow, same thing. Uh, seems like a great idea to go right up against the hedgerow, but if, it's a, if it holds a lot of moisture, you'll see a lot of snails there. So just a warning. Uh, the fasciola hepatica, the common liver fluke, Supposedly it's not in New York, but um, I have talked to people that whose vet feel they did have that particular fluke. The Fasciolides magna is the deer fluke and doesn't bother the deer, but when you get them in your sheep, it's not very good at all. And we'll talk about that also. I had a very bad experience with deer flukes. And the last one down there, the lancet fluke is really a health problem, even with heavy infestations, but it can cause your liver to be condemned at the slaughterhouse. So I think we're gonna talk about each of these uh, individually. So the hepatica or the common liver fluke or the sheep fluke, um, we used to think it wasn't east of the Mississippi, but there have been some affected animals in New York. I had a, a, a farmer to the east of me that did have lambs with flukes. And I'm not sure that they came from around here, the sheep, so it's possible they came with the sheep. Um, it does include freshwater snails in the life cycle. It does a, cause acute peritonitis to the liver because these little things, somehow, I don't know how they know where they're going, but they go around in the liver and uh, they even go around in the um, cavity, the, the uh, stomach cavity as well. Not in the stomach, but in the uh, area of the liver. And I'll show you a picture of why I say that. It often causes chronic wasting and problems afterwards, uh, if, even if you get rid of them. And uh, it can cause bottle jaw, like we were in anemia. So that's a little, you know, we talked about that being some something for the barber pole worm, but it could also be the fluke. It tends to be around here at least. Uh, I can't speak for everywhere, but in our climate, it tends to be these show up later in the summer or in the fall even, which usually the barber pole worm is earlier in the summer, usually. The magna is the deer fluke. Uh, it's definitely found in the Adirondacks, the Catskills. Anywhere there's deer, I would think. Uh, it's a natural parasite of the deer. It doesn't bother them, or that we know of at least. But in sheep and goats, they're not the normal host and it's not a good thing. So they, they're little and they don't actually mature, but they like to travel all around through the liver and make a big mess. So they don't mature and don't excrete eggs. So they're not passing it to each other like they might other worms, but uh, they're doing a lot of damage. And they also uh, tend to drag something around in there like that's clostridia and that can kill your sheep really quickly. It's an acute disease, it can be fatal within six months. And I'll show you some pictures, then I'll tell you a story. This is the liver of a goat killed by a deer fluke. And if you know, if you know what liver looks like, it's supposed to be sort of smooth and reddish brown and solid, not all full of uh, holes and uh, scar tissue. Uh, I'm just gonna go to the next picture for a minute. This is, um, the liver of a sheep who died of deer flukes. And unfortunately that's my kitchen sink and my hands and a liver from one of my many sheep that died from the deer flukes. And you can see the black uh, in the liver. And you can see, if you look down here, this is the uh, part of the reticulum and there's part of the diaphragm, everything. When I opened these up to do a necropsy, you have to realize this is like in the middle of winter, it was like five degrees out. Um, everything was stuck together inside the sheep. So there was a lot of irritation going on uh, by these little critters migrating around. 
I had to like hack it out of the other organs. So um, they were actually killed by Novii, Fusarium Novii, which is black liver disease or Black's disease, they call it sometimes. And um, so we had to try to kill the flukes, which is hard because they're not mature. And there aren't many things that will kill immature flukes. And we quickly gave them all a vaccine that had all the other Clostridium in them because I had only used CDT, which only has tetanus and overeating. And um, we did that all, it was freezing. And I had my daughter and her boyfriend who'd never been on a farm helping, but they were very good and, and uh, tried to help save the sheep. And um, we did give them Chlorcelon Ivermec Plus with Chlorcelon and we did give them Valbazin at a dose recommended by Mary Smith from Cornell. <clears throat> we didn't lose any more after they were treated, thankfully. I did have some that were sick, but didn't die that were just sort of, they would stand with like their head in the feeder, but not actually eat anything. They were just kind of very blah and they'd get skinny. And I had to, I nursed most of those back to health and they, they did surprisingly well after they recovered, but it was really uh, scary there for a while. I lost like 15 out of 110 or 20 sheep over from Halloween through Christmas. And the first one, the first one we found her, I found her down below uh, the farm of uh, the barn away with her head blown up the size of a basketball. And um, we couldn't, didn't really know what was wrong with her, but we laid her on the back of an ATV and drove her up to the barn and put her in the dark because it looked like it might be a photosensitive type reaction. And um, I had to, her lips, she was so swollen, you couldn't really open her mouth or anything. I had to drench her with water and Gatorade and I kept her alive and her head unswelled and then all her skin peeled off. Uh, she looked like the zombie sheep. She had uh, pus coming out of the middle of her eyeball on one side. And I probably would have been arrested if anybody actually saw her in the barn, but she survived and her name is Scarface, which surprisingly that was her name before this happened too, because she had a Harry Potter scar on her forehead. And um, she's still producing lambs and she's 10 or 11 years old. She looks horrible. I can't ever send her to the sale. She'll have to be euthanized at my house probably because she has a rat tail and only half an ear on each side and she's pretty rough looking, but she is pretty tough. And that was actually turned out to be the first one. We didn't know what caused that, but later looking back, we know that uh, the liver, having her liver messed up could have caused that. And then I just started finding sheep dead in the morning. I'd go in and there'd be a dead sheep in the barn, another dead sheep. And uh Eventually we put two and two together after doing these necropsies and finding the gross livers. So now what I do is uh, all my sheep get the seven way cluster deal, like something like vision seven, which is approved for sheep um, in the fall. And then because that doesn't have tetanus in it, I give the CDT in the spring before they lamb. And um, the reason uh, you can use Covaxin 8 that has everything and it's a very good product but it is, uh, it's a painful shot. So uh, it's a hard one to give over and over every year because they have to have five cc's, I think the first time. And uh, I find it easier to give them two cc's of the vision seven and two cc's of the CDT at different times. And uh, that doesn't seem to get such a big reaction out of them. They don't get left with a lump on their neck or anything like that. So um, that's my dear fluke story. And um, Nobody knew what it was at first, including me or the vet, but we did manage to do a little CSI and figure it out. So I'm going to go back here. So the best treatment for flukes is to prevent it, of course, and try to fence off wet areas, keep them out of the swamps, keep the deer out of your pasture. Now, my guard dogs would keep the deer out. The problem is when you're doing rotational grazing, they can only keep the deer out of the pasture that your sheep are actually in. And it's hard to kill the larvae. Uh, it's harder to kill them than the adult flukes. Uh, one thing that might work is albendazole, which is valbazin, if you go to buy it in the store, and you have the uh, dosage there. I'm not going to read that all off. Um, and chlorcelon, which is in Ivermec Plus, um, and there's your dosages for that. I would definitely work with your vet, though, if you think you have flukes, because you may have other things happening, too. And then we... I had the same thing here and be sure to give them the vaccine as soon as possible if you don't do that already. 
And I still do that at home. And at, at the extension farm, we've always given the, just the CDT with no problems, but um, we may be finding that when we sell our lamps to other people, that may be, be important for them to have the seven way. So we may change our uh, whole uh, process on that. So now we're gonna talk about coccidiosis. Now coccidiosis isn't a worm. It's actually a single celled protozoa that damages the lining of the small intestines. And it tends to show up in calves, lambs, or kids when they're young, like at three weeks of age. They get ex it's, it's in the adults a little bit at a low level all the time. And then when the, um, the young ones are born and they get to a certain age and they get exposed, then they um, uh, can have trouble. Uh, Tatiana, we need to admit Rachel there. She's in the waiting room. Okay, I've admitted her. Okay, great. I just saw it come up there. I didn't want to keep going until she got back in. Um, they tend to have a poopy butt or a mucky butt, and um, it's spread through the infected feces, decomposing feces in the soil or the bedding. It tends to be an indoor, an inside problem where you have pens of young animals or old and young animals mixed together, or animals that are uh, young but of different ages. So I can't, unfortunately I can't read the top of my slides because this is in the way here. Let me see if I can move it. Uh, high floating meeting controls, there we go. So severe coccidiosis causes many small white foci in the intestinal wall. So those are like little scar tissue places. And so absorption is impaired and it damages both the small and large intestines. So they're eating fine, but they're not getting the nutrients from what they eat. And that's a pretty bad one picture there. Now I gotta find my little dot here. Come on, there we go. So Emiria, and they were on that little chart that we looked at up on the top left. They were, look like they're the same shape as the other eggs, but smaller, they're kind of like uh, a hard boiled egg cut in half lengthwise. There's many species, but they're host specific. So you don't have to worry about your chickens being in with your lambs or something like that. Um, they do develop immunity to each species with exposure, but you don't wanna like overexpose them at first. So you wanna avoid sudden exposure to large amounts of infected species, feces, which could happen if you're bringing things into your barn or weaning things into the barn, that sort of thing. Uh, stress is, can make it worse and young animals don't have much immunity built up yet. So um, older animals can have the same problem also with other worms that they uh, don't have as much immunity. And so they can be susceptible to coccidia as well. So orphans, when you're weaning them, when you're moving them to a new home, uh, young mothers that are stressed, you know, nursing new babies. Um, and when you have too many in a small space, that's true of almost everything. It's not a great thing. So a lower density of animals helps. And uh, coccidia is a tough one. You, it, you can never really kill it. Even when you treat it, you don't kill it. You just kind of stamp it back. And um, so if it's warm and moist, like the bedded pack or wet spots of spoiled feed and that sort of thing, uh, that permits sporulation. And it goes from eggs to infectious in one to two days. So that's pretty quick. And it can survive a long time under good conditions. So the best thing is sunlight, fresh air, low humidity, um, clean sanitation in your barn. You see the lamb standing in the feeder? None of our lambs do that, do they? You know, and goats like to do that also, stand in the feeder and poop. And so it's spread around pretty easily. If, if one animal in the pen has it, they probably all have, have it to some extent. And they do build up immunity as they age, but it can also be bad enough that it's uh, really affecting their health as well. So ideally you'd raise your dairy kids and lambs away from the adults. Um, if possible, you can separate the young animals by age. So you don't have them, you know, new, like if you're lambing several times in the spring, some people lamb, you know, some in May, some in June, that kind of thing. You don't want to mix those together. And luckily when they're nursing, the milk is protective. So, but then when you wean them, that's a very high risk time for coccidiosis. So you want clean, dry sunlight if possible, 
want to avoid some sudden exposure to feces, especially at weaning time. And a couple of pictures here, they can, animals can sit up on these benches away from the fecal matter. Of course, sometimes they like to lay under the benches just because they can. And here's some that are outside where the sun and the air are hitting the ground and, and uh, hopefully killing some of the coccidia or keeping it from um, being very high population at least. We have in the past um, put decox or one of the other, uh, I guess we usually use decox in our mineral mix and fed it to our sheep in the barn, the adults before lambing to help get the population down in the adults before lambing. Um, but there isn't a huge population in our adults, so I'm not sure whether that is really effective or not, but it might be, if you're having a problem, it might be worth trying. So conventional, if you're not organic, uh, you can use coccidia stats as additives in the feed or maybe in the salt or the water to help prevent it. So um, here, this is sort of what we were talking about, especially in pregnant females starting one month before parturition. So month before lambing or kidding until weaning of their young, you can put this, um, usually we use decox these days into their mineral or um, into their feed. Now, ours don't get much grain, so it'd be tough to put it in their feed. Um, these are some of the different ones you may have heard of, Bovatec, Rumensin, and decox. Now, at least our feed mill prefers to use decox because it's not toxic to horses, which some of the other ones are. And so, um, and they make horse feed. So they'll use decox in our feed if we ask for it, but they won't um, put the other things in anymore. And Corid, we have seen Corid as amprolium. Corid is the trade name, comes in a jug or also comes as a powder. And it is approved for sheep and goats. And if you read the directions on the back, it tells you how to mix it. You can either put it in the feed trough, which is a little iffy because you don't really know how much they're gonna drink. You're hoping they drink what you're predicting. And you have to keep it clean. So you then have to dump the thing and start again every so often. Um, I like to do the drench, even though you have to do it five days in a row. Hopefully you don't have to do like 500 of them five days in a row. I think in that case, you're probably gonna have to go for the water. But um, if you have a, a pen of uh, kids or lambs that you need to treat, the uh, drench seems like the way to go. And it tells you on the package uh, how to mix that. There are oral sulfonamides like Sulmet, Elbon, uh, sulfoquinoxalone, which is one of those probably. But there's a veterinary feed directive now that requires a vet prescription to use them. So you may not be able to get it uh, prescribed uh, by your vet, but you can ask, but they can't just put it in your feed anymore uh, for you to use. And it looks like if you're milking, I didn't realize this, but if you're milking, that makes sense because they're basically an antibiotic. You can use them if you uh, have milking animals. So Corid, there's the rate for Corid. There are instructions on the package. For five days, one ml of Corid at that rate per eight pounds. And it, I mix it up and then I put it in the fridge. It keeps pretty well in the fridge. So you, can, you don't have to mix it up every single day. Um, you can add it to the milk. I just directly drench it. it was, uh, worked for me in my situation. I have a cat crawling on me here. There we go. Ideally, you know, it helps to keep your animal healthy in general. So make sure they have enough selenium and um, make sure you can supplement them with electrolytes or electrolytes are your supplemental nutrition and help alleviate the stress. And that'll help keep the coccidia down. I have had problems with it in the past. I haven't had any problems recently, thankfully. We had it more when we lambed in the winter and we had animals inside together more than we do on pasture. We have other things on pasture, but not so much coccidia. And we're also gonna talk about another worm from the deer. Thanks deer. Uh, the deer worm or the brain worm, or you might hear, hear it called P tenuous. And it's a, it is a parasite of the white-tailed deer, but in small ruminants like sheep and goats, especially, and llamas and alpacas, and I didn't realize it was bad for fellow deer, but it, is, it, has, it, it can cause a lot of problems. Uh, it has an indirect life cycle, cycle with those darn snails and slugs in the pasture. So I swear the deer and the snails are in cahoots, 
So this is how it works. The deer eats the forage that contains the slime trail of a slug or snail that's infected. And the larvae migrate through the stomach wall to the peritoneal cavity. Then they get in the lumbar spinal nerves. So what I really want to know is how these little things know where they're going, but somehow they know where they're going. They reach, I know they don't have GPS, but they must have something. They reach the spinal cord in 10 days. And then once they're in there, it becomes much harder to kill them, right? Because things like ivermectin don't cross the blood brain barrier. You know, we don't know what will get into the spinal cord. It's not like uh, the stomach. And they develop in an orderly man matter manner in the gray matter of the spinal cord. And then they return to the surface of the spinal cord at 40 days, mature and migrate to the cranium, that's the head, right? To live and reproduce. And then the eggs are laid into the blood vessels and the eggs hatch into first stage larvae in the lungs. And then they enter the bronchial tree. They're coughed up, swallowed and passed in the feces. So that's a pretty complicated life cycle and it's hard to believe it works at all, but it does. And when they get into your sheep or goats, they tend to get into your into their spinal cord and then cause trouble there. So if they're excreted in the mucus coating of the fecal pellets 90 plus days after the deer is infected. So you usually do find these this happening later in the summer or in, in the fall, even into the winter. And they can be killed by drying or solar radiation, but they resist freezing. That's not good. Um, the snails and slugs crawl over the deer feces and the larvae penetrate the snail's foot, believe it or not. And they become infective in two to three months, depending on the temperature. And they persist for the life of the snail or slug. <clears throat> They're excreted in the slime trail into the vegetation. And um, I, I didn't know this, there's a mean of three larvae for each infected snail. So pretty soon we're going to be doing fecal samples on snails to see if we uh, what they have. But when they get into our sheep and goats, they get into the spinal cord and um, get confused because it's not a deer. It causes all kinds of nerve damage, lameness. Uh, they sort of wobble in the back end a lot of times. Uh, they might itch at a spot. I had one that uh, scratch like scratch with her back leg sort of weirdly for a while. We did get her stopped. And it can actually uh, get the par paralysis can get pretty bad and they can die or they can just become, you know, that they can't get up and then they, they can't uh, really do very well. But they usually are bright. They want to eat. There's nothing else wrong with them. So they're pretty happy. They just can't move around. You see this uh, black faced sheep is pretty typical. She's like sitting with her back end down and her front end up. I had one that dragged her back leg. I've had one that I thought got smashed by the uh, goats because she was like wobbly in the back end. Um, they can show up in different ways. And, and we'll look at the, uh, we do have some videos to show you of what they look like. So treatment of P. tenuous. An, an aberrant host means a host that isn't, doesn't normally have that worm. So there were no controlled studies in sheep and goats, but Cornell has completed a three-year study comparing two treatment protocols on naturally infected sheep and goats on 14 farms in Ithaca, in that area at least. And um, they were scored, they had like a neurological scorecard so that we could, uh, you know, sort of document their symptoms. And they were videotaped the first day or two of treatment and after treatment. Now we can all do videos on our phone, we can do these things. So we were trying to determine if ivermectin is needed in the treatment because um, ivermectin is not supposed to pass through the blood brain barrier. So can it get into the spinal cord? We didn't really know. So uh, that was the idea is there were two different treatments, one that included ivermectin and one that included what was a placebo for the ivermectin. So usually you treat them with some sort of anti-inflammatory like dexamethasone. And uh, sometimes they use banamine if it's a pregnant animal and um, but remember those do have a fairly long withdrawal. And fenbendazole or Safeguard, which is one of the dewormers we'll talk about in a little while because that um, is one of the dewormers that's proof for goats. And then some of them got ivermectin and some of them got something that looked like ivermectin, but the farmer didn't know whether it was ivermectin or not. So that, that was the test. I'm gonna show you, I hope here. Oh, come on, this worked just before. Picture of an infected sheep. 
I wonder if you need to get rid of your pointer for a minute. I could try it. Be worth a try. Yeah, and try a regular clicker, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, let's try. It. Oh, good idea, Tatiana. Okay, this is an infected sheep. See how she's sort of wobble or weak in the back end and can't get up. And here she is. Oops, that's her again. Okay, let me stop that. I can't find my cursor. There we go. Sorry. Here she is after treatment. She's pretty good. She's still a little bit, but not bad. She can get her along. I had one that recovered, but I eventually found her. She got upside down in a hole in the pasture, but couldn't get out. Wasn't strong enough or couldn't coordinate to get out again. Okay. I think this one, the owner did end up telling um, just because they were moving their animals with a stock trailer from pa pasture to pasture and mm -hmm. she had trouble jumping into the stock trailer. Right, like she could walk around and eat and function, but it was, wasn't quite right. Yeah. Oh, and there's a, pers a person in the, the waiting room. Okay. <clears throat> okay. By my cursor. Here's the infected goat. And sometimes these animals will appear completely paralyzed and they, they can, some of them will completely recover from that. Some will show some, some problems afterwards and, and some don't, don't respond to treatment. It seems like the sooner you catch it, like sometimes I'm really slow to catch on because I don't have it very often. You catch it early, it seems like you, you have a lot better chance of getting them better. And I think in this study, that was what we tended to find. I, I do know um, that I've had ones that just immediately when they got it, went completely paralyzed and we treated them right away and they came out of it very quickly. So I think a lot of it has to do with how quickly you start treatment. Even if they, even so, if they really suddenly. Before we start this, do you want to tell what the results of the study were? Oh, sure. Yeah, I didn't realize that didn't have it. Um, yeah, so what we found in the study was that um, if we had many animals that recovered that did not get the ivermectin, but when we asked the farmers, um, when we asked the farmers if they wanted to give the animal something more after the five days of treatment, uh, animals that had not gotten the ivermectin, the farmers were more likely to say they wanted to give them something more. <laughs> and in that case, they, they usually gave them ivermectin since they knew they, you know, they knew that they may not have gotten the ivermectin. So uh. because of that, even though the recovery rates seemed pretty similar between the two groups, we ended up having to say that there might be a slight chance that the ivermectin helps, it might just be that it makes the safeguard a little more, more powerful, you know, that it doesn't pass through the blood brain membrane, but it just poisons the worm a little bit more. The fact that you have, you know, the, are giving it along with the safeguard. Um, so our recommendation ended up being that if you weren't going to slaughter the animal, because the big disadvantage of the ivermectin is that 94 day withdrawal period when you give it for the five days. So is that injectable? I'm yes, it was injectable, but I think okay. it would been the same if it was given orally. And I know for treating deer worm, I used to give it orally uh, because I didn't know you were supposed to, in that case, use it as an injectable. But for the study, we gave it in, as an injectable. So we ended up recommending that if it was a pet animal or an animal that you knew you weren't gonna, wasn't going to end up in the slaughter chain, so that 94-day period didn't matter to you, then go ahead and give it both things because the ivermectin for five days isn't very doesn't add much to the cost of the um, of, of the treatment. But otherwise, if it is an animal that if it doesn't recover, you're going to put into the food chain or that may someday, you know, fairly soon within before 94 days are up going into the food chain, then we recommended not giving the ivermectin. Um, 
because chances were it doesn't really help at all. Okay, that's good. But it's good to talk to your vet about it. I know like in the case of my vets, the vet service I use, they don't reduce the amount of dexamethasone that's given after the first three days, they keep it up. Um, at the study at Cornell, we did drop it some after the first three days, we gave it at half as much. And that's just because um, the longer you give a steroid like that, the more chance that the animal might pick up a secondary uh, bacteria infection, you know, that their immune system might be a little compromised. Okay, no. And I just no, want to say is on that second animal, uh, she did semi recover from the deer worm, but uh, and she and we didn't tell her for I think she was pregnant at the time and we let her go through two more pregnancies after that. And at each pregnancy, she would sort of go down a little, uh, which some people go, oh, they're reinfected. But instead, it was just that the nerve damage would catch up to her when she was in heavy pregnancy. And then after the third pregnancy, we went, okay, it's just going to get worse and worse. It's time to color, you know. And so at that point, we colored her. Uh, Right, so then, you can treat it, but often I found that too, that they didn't, they're not totally recovered. Actually, I know, I think I had four or five animals at my farm that ended up being on the study because those happened to be bad deer worm years for us, coincidentally. And I was also trying to get animals a little infected. So I was leaving them near our woody areas for long. But out of those animals, I think three of them completely recovered. And really only two were like her where they where you could tell afterwards. So well, really, that's good. And a lot of it has to do, I think, with how soon you can start treatment. And the goats seem to respond to treatment better than the sheep um, did. But I think that may have just been coincidental. Mm -hmm. So like I said, the problem with me is I know think of that at first when I see one limping a little or dragging a foot or something. I'm like, what is wrong with her? Did she step in a hole? Or <laughs> you have to, you know. You have to remember all the possibilities and uh, like you say, treat them early if you can. Um, okay, now we've given you the life cycles of umpteen different worms and other parasites and um, we're going to talk about what you can do about it. But I'm going to give you like a three minute break so you can all go get a drink of water, stretch for a minute, uh, use the bathroom, pet the dog, whatever you need to do. Uh, and we'll be back here like two, three minutes. Just uh, Give us a quick break to to uh, stretch for a minute because I know it's hard to just sit and stare at the Zoom all the time. I feel like I should play some kind of music. <laughs> yeah, I I actually thought you were going to delay the break till the switch between us and then they could be leaving while I was. Yeah, they could do that too. No, nah, we'll we've done this already. They're, it'll just be a little longer stretch for the next one. Well, I'm gonna keep this, this is a short break. This is like a two or three minute break. Yep. No, I'm just saying they're gonna be sitting for a while longer now because it wasn't <laughs> an hour yet. Okay, I can get the cat off me for a minute. I'm going to mute for a second. Oh, should I be stopping the recording for a second or probably not? You can leave the recording going. It's better if it's all on one recording. Okay, good. So, I'm going to get started Olivia, here in about one minute. Olivia had a comment in the chat about how ah. she experienced it in an alpaca. Oh, yeah. Um, Julie's asking about the dosage and the trials um, for the safeguard in the ivermectin. And did, was that on the slide? 
I can go back a couple of slides and look quick. I don't, I believe, it, well, look back and see. Yeah, I don't remember. I can't remember if it's on there. If not, there's a fact sheet at your uh, website, which I'm going to send out on the, oops, I, gotta, I have to take my chat down because I can't see anything with the chat up. Uh, let's see here. I'm working my way back by getting a slow response on the clicker here. Is it here? Yeah, uh, it's not per hundred pounds, but it's mil micro milligrams, micrograms per kilogram. Right. That works out to in uh, real life, like those of us that don't do kilograms and micrograms and. If you, it, it, I mean, it would be about half that, so. Okay. You know, um, but it, it is it is in that fact sheet. I believe it's given. The, I think so too. There's also if they go to the if they go to the page in, um, in the Cornell Small Ruminant uh, Research um, website, uh, if they go to the the deerworm page there, uh, it there's a letter to the farmers that has the table that we use that has it in line. Oh yeah. Right. I remember so that. I can send you the I can send you an attachment. That's yep. that table. And then you could let people have that table. Yeah, I can also just put I'll put the link to both places in there in the uh, follow up with the uh, recording. Because I have a bunch of uh, we're going to have a couple charts of the worms and a couple of charts of the dewormers and some things like that that'll all be on the uh, follow up email that has the recording link, which will probably be tomorrow, because I think by the time we finish tonight, I won't be able to get it all together. Okay, and hopefully everybody's back. And we're going to start with the know your weapons. And um, we're going to talk about those great dewormers that you can buy at the feed store, or maybe have to send for in the mail. And we're also going to talk about pasture management, which is really important. And also some of the things coming up, how to deworm only the sheep that need it, and uh, you know, genetic selection, um, the immune system, nutrition. There's lots of uh, different ways you can fight these little critters. So we'll talk about, I'm going to talk about the uh, chemical dewormers, and then Tatiana is going to tackle the rest of it. So we have some chemical dewormers. I will say that they're not necessarily easy to find at your local feed store. You may want to order them from Premier or Jeffers or PBS um, or some of those other livestock supply places because at least in our local stores, they only have one kind and um, that doesn't necessarily one that works. So you need to uh, maybe keep a few on hand that you of different types, which we'll talk about the different types in a minute. And there's there's only a few, and if you know if you have sheep and goats, that there's not a lot of um, you know, big investment by chemical companies to make more dewormers for us because we just have sheep and goats and they're not considered a major species. And so we need to take really good care of the dewormers we have and manage them properly so we don't develop too much resistance among the worm population. So there's three drug families. And these are some pictures of some, but one is the benzimidazoles, and they all end in zole, benbendazole, uh, which is safeguard, albendazole, which is velbazin, and oxybendazole, which I don't know what that actually, if that has a uh, commercial name. Um, and they look, these are white, they look like Elmer's glue or like the sap from a milkweed, uh, and they're kind of sticky like that, they're white. Um, the white, also called the white dewormers. There's the nicotinics, levamazole, which is also known as prohibit, morantel, and pyrantel, which are other dewormers. And these are a little, um, we'll talk about them more in detail in just a minute. I won't want to get carried away here. The macrolids uh, are the avermectins. Most of them end in ectin. Ivermectin is probably the most well-known. Remember when ivermectin first came out, it had to be maybe in the 80s. I was at a uh, national extension meeting and we were, the people that make ivermectin were actually um, 
talking to us, like inter- letting us do interviews with them to take home and play on the radio because this was a totally new type of dewormer. And boy, it wasn't that long ago. And now a lot of the worms are resistant to ivermectin, but there is cydectin and uh, doramectin. I think cydectin is actually maybe moxidectin. Um, and they can still work in some situations. I, one of them, like ivermectin works pretty well at home, but not at work for me. We'll talk about how you can tell whether they're working or not as well. So these are the white drenches we talked about, the ones that look like Elmer's glue. Safeguard or Panicure, you may have heard those names. Also approved for goats, which is uh, unlike many things. They're very broad spectrum. They're very safe. I'm pretty sure that for the deer fluke, uh, Dr. Smith had me give five times the dose on the bottle, which seems like it might kill him, but it, it didn't. Uh, saved him actually. So it has a wide margin of safety. It's effective against tapeworms. It's, it's the only class of drenches that are effective against tapeworms. And um, valbazin, which is also, uh, is effective against adult liver flukes, the regular kind of liver flukes. And it says here should not be administered to pregnant animals, but I thought that said, and Todd, you can argue with me if you think so, in the first trimester, you're not supposed to use it. Right. 45 days after breeding. It's primarily in the first trimester. And it caused birth defects. And, you can and, see the and pictures. And abortion, yeah. Oh, abortion also. That's good. Right, because, the birth, because of the birth defects. Oh, the birth defects, okay. So you do want to be careful of that. And so if you're breeding your animals in the fall, or you know, some people are breeding them early now for you know January, February lambs or goats, you could have pregnant animals that you're deworming. You want to be careful with the valve. And uh, one of the things you often see at the uh, like tractor supply, they have the little tiny bottles of safeguard um, there and. Uh, are you going to talk about the dosage on those? Uh, no, you, ha- you have a table that you'll be sending people. Okay. You uh, might want to look at the table because it might be different than what's on the bottle. Right. The, the table is from the American Consortium for Small Ruminant um, Parasite Control. And so what they did is put what they felt were effective dosages, and then they contacted FARAD, which is the food animal res- uh, residue avoidance database and they contacted the veterinarians there and got from them um, a recommend, uh, fairly official recommendations for the withdrawals at the amount that they were saying you should use. And so those tables are really good to look at and you can share them with your veterinarian and discuss them with your veterinarians, those tables, because you would be then giving the dewormer off label if you're not using it exactly the way the label says to. And so technically you should have a vet prescription to do that. So I will send those charts. I downloaded them today. Um, and those will be coming out in your follow-up email. So the nicotinics, levamazole. Um, I've used Prohibit. They also come as, a, uh, the drench is ideal. They do come as a bolus, but I can't figure out how you would ever do boluses and adjust for the weight of the animals. You'd have to be cutting them into thirds and halves. And it's not that easy to give a bolus to a sheep or goat besides. It's much easier to drench them. So there's Tramazole, Levam- Le- Levazole, and, Pro- and Prohibit is the one that seems to be available now. And it's a powder that you mix up. They have to read the directions on the back and mix it up correctly. I mix it at the more, the stronger um, drench. I find that easier to give because it's less volume of drench per animal, but you have to have a, you have to do a good job drenching them because this is not as safe as the, or not as, it doesn't have as big of a margin of safety as the white trenches do. And Morintel, also known as Rumatel or the positive goat pellet, and pyrantel, which is strongid, which I don't think is uh, actually uh, approved for sheep or goats, but those of you with horses are be familiar with strongid. So here they are. They just put all that stuff right up there that I was just talking about. Um, 
it is a broad spectrum and it says it's effective against arrested larvae. Is that the ones that are in the sheep in the winter that have gone to sleep? Right, that would be the other name for hypobiotic or um, hibernating or dormant larvae. Those would be the L4 larvae that often hibernate in the winter time. Or if there's right. So I didn't think any of the dewormers were effective against those. So that's interesting. Oh no, oh no, they are, but they it just takes they're just harder to kill because their metabolism is slowed down. Oh yeah, that makes sense. And they do have a narrower margin of safety. It says, especially in injectable products, but hopefully you're not going to be uh, using injectables of this type on your sheep and goats. You should be using a drench. Yeah, I think the Levam Le Levamazole no longer comes out as an injectable uh, for sheep and goats. Uh, okay. Yeah, I've never seen that one. It's but... another powder that you mix with water. Yeah, that's a prohibit is what we use. Right. Um, the macrolids. Ivermectin, uh, you'll see that in a lot of forms, like Epronex is a poron, but that's, you know, for cattle. Um, Promectin, I don't even have never seen that one. Zymectric, Ivermectin. Doramectin is Dectomax. Uh, for a while, there were people trying to use that to inject their sheep, which is off-label. Betsy, and, I think if you hit enter, it'll, it'll bring up the, the information. Oh. Oh yeah, I forgot that. Thanks. <laughs> They're broad spectrum. They have a wide margin of safety. They're effective against sucking external parasites. Um, oxydectin is the newest one, has a little persistent activity, which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing as far as resistance goes, but uh, I suppose it could help if you're having a problem. Cydectin is approved for sheep and goats now, or at least for sheep. I can't speak for goats, but the the bottle I have says has a sheep dosage on it. And I don't think Dectomax, we're gonna talk about that actually. I think I've got a thing here. So approved for goats, Fembendazole, which is Safeguard, Rumatel, and Velbazin. So you've got two in the white, white uh, dewormer group and another one. And then approved for sheep is Velbazin, Ivermax, a Cydectin is approved for sheep. I added that one to the slide because it was not on here. And Levamazole, which is the prohibit. So it's very confusing because there's like two names for everything, the, uh, the chemical name and the, the trade name. So the use of a product that's different than its label is extra label use. And that requires a vet prescription in context of a valid, you have to have a relationship with this vet for them to make a recommendation. And then you have to remember if you're milking your sheep or goats or cows or whatever, that uh, that there's a whole different withdrawal and not that many of them are approved for dairy animals. And uh, as a result, you should use exaggerated withdrawals when you're using them extra label. So keep good records and you can check. There's the website you can check uh, to see what the withdrawal could be. Or actually your vet usually has to do that, I think. I did look once and you have to put in your veterinary license, I believe, to get that. Though, though Betsy, what they've added nowadays is they have a frequently asked questions section. Oh, is I haven't there, looked lately. Yeah, and when, when you look there, it often gives you information about someone else who's asked about what's the withdrawal for, you know, Ivermec drench if I'm using it on a goat instead of a sheep. But it's your technically your vet is going to be writing a prescription for you for that for the use of that drug off label, and so your vet can check. But you can also look online since most you know and, and give that information. Mm -hmm. And then, as I said, Betsy's going to be handing out a table where the American Consortium already talked to Farad about the dosages they're giving and gives the withdrawals that at that time Farad gave them. For it. Right. So now that we've we've talked about the drugs, we didn't talk about giving them. Are you going to talk about that, Todd? Like yes, not under dosing and yes, ev evidently I I I talk about that. It turns out yeah. I I went, oh, it would have been good to have put that forward. So I'm gonna we're gonna switch screens now. Okay. Um if, if that's okay, Betsy. Yep, I'm gonna stop sharing. There you go. Now, that way she can control the uh, PowerPoint herself.
And we're going to talk about a lot of different things you can do. And it is a challenge for those of you that only have a couple animals, for example, your strategy is going to be different from somebody that has a thousand sheep or something like that. So you have to think about what can apply in your situation and then, you know, try to do it. And it's not always easy, I will say. It's sometimes very frustrating. There you go. It just came up, Todd. All right. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and talk about some of the things you can do as far as grazing management to help reduce primarily barber pole worm problems. And a lot of this is going to focus on barber pole worm. And so the amount of pasture contamination you're going to get with your worm eggs is often influenced by the height of your pasture that you're grazing at, how long you're grazing that particular paddock uh, before you take the animals back out of there and then how long you rest that paddock before you bring the animals back in. And it's gonna be really easy for me to give you recommendations, but these recommendations may be impractical for you when it comes to the entire grazing cycle or for your particular farm. And so because of that, when you talk about trying to have these uncontaminated or fairly uncontaminated pastures, you're gonna to wanna to do this grazing management practice primarily with your most susceptible animals. So giving priority to those animals. And that's gonna be your recently weaned young stock, your lactating does and ewes, especially those that have kids, kids or lambs at their side. And then lastly, your dry animals, which are gonna to tend to build up more immunity. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is go through the life cycle of barber pole worm um, a little bit and to sort of give us an idea of what's happening out in a pasture. And I'm gonna sort of start out with thinking about, okay, it's May 1st and your animals are going out to pasture for the first time after winter's over. Um, and Betsy went through some of this. So I'm afraid some of this will be a little bit of a, but it, it's complicated. So it's probably good to go through it twice. All right. So, the eggs are in the feces, you let your sheep or your goats out into that grazing paddock and they squat down and they pee and then they poop. And you've got fresh eggs in that poop. And when it comes to barber pole worm, it requires things to be somewhat warm before that worm is actually gonna hatch. It does start hatching at as cool, cool as 50 degrees. And by 60 degrees Fahrenheit, you get lots of response. And it also requires some humidity. And in studies they've done in the lab, it takes about three to five days for a barber pole worm to hatch when it's in the upper 70s and a lot longer to hatch when it's in the upper 50s, or I mean low 50s. But in reality, in, our, in New York, once May comes, our, our, our temperatures start heating up pretty quickly. So it's really only in the fall that you get really long periods of time when it's 50 to 52 degrees. So in general, we usually say the eggs are going to hatch from one to six days. Um, in, in the warm, hot weather that we had this summer, a lot of those eggs were probably hatching within the first 24 hours. And they hatch into what's called an L1 larva. And that L1 larva doesn't leave the fecal pellet. It just sits in there and it eats bacteria. And then it grows and it molts and it sheds its skin just like, like a snake would and it becomes an L2, and the L2 does the same thing. It just eats bacteria in the feces and stays in that fecal pellet. If a dung beetle comes along and buries that pellet, it can't get out of that pellet, okay? It's just pretty much stuck in there, okay? And keep in mind that direct sunlight can heat that fecal pellet up to 155 degrees Fahrenheit, and at that point, it'll kill that L2 larva or that L1 larva inside the pellet. And so because of that, that first run through a pasture when the pasture is still pretty short, if you mow that pasture right after the animals have left it, and there's a lot of fresh eggs and L1 and L2 larva in the fecal material, if you mow it on, that, on, on a really sunny day and the sun's able to hit those pellets, it can do the sterilization. Unfortunately, later on in the season, when you mow it short, when you mow it short like that, there's going to be a nice covering of mulch usually over that fecal pellet. So you're not going to get that direct sunlight on it. Um, shade trees and tall, dense trash are going to help shade that pellet and help, help those worm eggs survive. 
and help those L1 and L2 larvae. The L2 then molts to become an L3 larva. And the L3 larva is what's infectious. If your goat or sheep had swallowed up that you know, fecal pellet with the L1 larva in it or the L2 larva in it, that L1 larva or that L2 larva will cause no damage to your sheep. Okay, it's the L3 that is the infectious one. Okay, and when, because it's, this L3 is gonna have to escape from the fecal pellet and it's gonna live outside of the fecal pellet. And because of that, nature has made it so that it doesn't get rid of its second skin. That second skin from when it was an L2 stays on it and it gets an L3, um, it gets a second skin as well. And the skin, the first skin doesn't come off of the mouth. So this L3 larva can't eat. It can't eat bacteria, it can't eat anything, okay? And it has to live off its it stored reserves. But the problem is that worms are cold-blooded and so in hot weather, the, their metabolism speeds up and this L3 larva can survive about 30 to 60 days without eating. And in cold weather where its metabolism is slower, it can live up to 120 to 240 days. And we used to think that the L3 larva couldn't survive freezing when it came to barber pole worm. And your other strongyle worms have very similar, similar, um, similar um, life cycles but they tend to hatch at a cooler temperature than the barber pole worm does. They don't need that 50 degree temperature. So it takes about five to 14 days for the, L, for the worm to go from being an egg in that fresh fecal pellet to being an infectious L3 larva. And at this point, your pasture is now infectious. Um, Betsy, there's someone that needs to get, uh, Olivia needs to be admitted back into the waiting, back from the waiting room. Um, and so the, and that five to 14 days really varies depending upon what the temperature is like. The cooler and drier the temperature is, the longer it'll take it. The L3 larva in California and places like that will die in heat waves when it's really, really dry. Unfortunately, we usually get heat waves that are really wet. Um, and in our, and probably this last summer with how warm it wet as was, that L3, it, the eggs may have become, been a, becoming an L3 in as early as three days, okay? Most of your L3 larva, and you can see them in this, in these, in this dew drop on this grass, um, don't, can't crawl up, can't, can't move up with the morning dew or with the rain, more than about two inches high in grass. About 80% of them are gonna be two inches or lower in your grass, okay? So the L3 has to escape from the fecal pellet in order to infect an animal. It can only live about a week or two inside a fecal pellet if it's hot or dry. The pellet needs to be broken up by rain for the L3 larva to escape it. But that only requires about two inches of rain in a month's time. And unfortunately in New York, we usually get those two inches of rain. And then it moves around on water. It can get under leaves, or generally what it does is in the morning dew, it comes up on up tall on the forage, forage and then as your um, morning dew dries up, evaporates, it, re, it recedes back down into the, in, to, down towards the ground. And it's survival of the fittest, fittest so only about two to 10% of the eggs actually end up as L3 larva. Um, and in the tropics, the population of L3 uh, after the eggs, have, after the animals have come into a pasture and stopped, started dropping eggs in that pasture, the L3 peaks at about 14 days later. And, un, and in New York, unfortunately, it's not 14 days later. In our temperate climates, it's more like 35 days later it peaks. So the worm, that infectious worm population is peaking about 35 days after that fresh manure got deposited on the pasture. It needs to be eaten by a goat or sheep to continue development. And cattle, cattle can get, and can get um, homunculus contortus, can get barber pole worm as well. But cattle and horses, um, they don't share the exact same strain of barber pole worm. And barber pole worm is fairly species specific. So while sheep and goats share the same barber pole worm, there's really only one strain of barber pole worm that young calves get 
that sheep and goats also get, okay? So if you have your cattle or horses come in and vacuum up those L3 larvae, that can, that'll help stop its life cycle. It won't be able to lay eggs enough, the barber pole worm that came from that sheep or the goat. And so ideally, if you can bring those sheep or goat, those cattle or horses on about 35 days after that, those eggs were deposited during the grazing season, um, you'll have a whole bunch of L3 larvae there that your horses and cattle can be running around vacuuming up for you. Um, and we used to think that the L3 barber pole worm larva couldn't survive outside in the Northeast over the winter. But they've done studies at the University of Maine where they took barber pole worm larva that they got out of, um, that they got out of, um, that were hatched out of Maine, Maine sheep and goats and subjected them to really cold temperatures. And they found that the ones in Maine that are now in Maine can tolerate 10 degrees Fahrenheit for up to three to six days before they die off. Versus they took um, worms that they got, L3 larva they, they got from, um, from, um, from sheep and goats in Georgia and subjected them to really low temperatures. And they found that they started, that they died off at about 20 to 25 degrees Fahrenheit. So unfortunately the barber pole worm as it's moving north it's being select, you know, it's selection of the fittest and it's being genetically selected to be able to survive colder and colder temperatures. Hey, Todd, maybe we need to cross, we need to get some of those Southeast barber pole worms and cross, and cross them, them with in. Them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. That's a good point. That maybe if you bought a buck from Georgia, it might not be that bad if he's bringing up worms. Right, if he brings a few worms. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> about that, but yeah. Once the L3 larva is inside the goat once or sheep, once your animal has eaten it, it gets rid of that covering over its mouth and that's called exchismet. And it can now start eating and it makes a decision on whether it molts into an L4 larva. And that L4 larva has to make a decision on whether to go ahead and become an adult or go into hibernation. Okay, go into suspended animation. And it makes that decision based on how many adult worms are already in that animal. Um, and if there's already a whole bunch of adult worms there, it goes, whoa, I don't wanna become an adult now. There's too much competition. I'm gonna hibernate. Or it also gets cues as to whether winter, it's winter time. And in winter time, it goes, oh, it's not worth being an adult right now. I'm gonna go ahead and hibernate, okay? And I'm gonna now talk about evadance or avoidance parasite grazing. And this is when you base a lot of your grazing decisions on the parasites rather than necessarily on the nutrition of your pasture or the health of your pasture, as far as the health of the plants, you know, what's healthy for the plants. And so with evasive or avoidance grazing, you wanna move your sheep or goats out of that grazing paddock fast enough that you prevent them from getting infected with the feces that, that they've deposited in that pasture during this, this little grazing period. So if you brought them in here three days earlier, you know, the chances are there's no mature larva unless it's been really warm and wet. Um, and so they're not gonna get themselves reinfected. If you're leaving them in there seven days, there's a lot more chance that there's infectious larva from the feces that they pooped out the first day they were out there in that pasture and they can reinfect themselves. And so we usually say that during the grazing season, it takes about five to 14 days to go from being an egg to being an infectious larva. With it being five days when the conditions are warm and wet and 14 days later on, like in the fall, okay? So our recommendation normally is to play it safe by moving your out, animals out of a pasture within about four days during the warm, wet part of the grazing season. So May, June, July, August, and then September, October, November, move them out more like every seven days, move them out of the area. And you also wanna move them earlier if the pasture is getting too short, i.e. if it's around three inches or so, you're gonna wanna move them out even if they've only been there a day or two because remember most of those worms are in the bottom, are in that 
80% of the worms are in those bottom two inches. And when there's only three inches of grazing, they're gonna be doing a lot of grazing at two inches. So these recommendations about moving the animals out within about four days um, and moving them out before the pastures got in very short, those are also very helpful when it comes to the pasture regrowing back nice and fast and, also, and the plants staying nice and healthy and surviving. And also when it comes to the nutrition of your pasture, all of those recommendations are really good there. And one thing you can do because it's, uh, is when it's warm and wet, like right now, where you think the life cycle may be even shorter than four days as far as becoming an L3 larva, you can move the fence forward every single day, but move the back fence up every four days. Um, so the animals are getting new grazing every day, but they have no opportunity to graze back more than four days because you're moving that back fence up every four days at least, okay? Now the problem with evasive or avoidance grazing is you're also supposed to allow a long enough rest period between using when you use that pasture and when you use it again, when you use that paddock and when you use it again, that you get substantial die off of those infectious L3 larva. And we showed earlier that that L3 larva can live for quite a long time. And so we're generally saying, that you wanna leave them out of that pasture for 60 days, even up to 105 days. And this is why in the old days, they used to say that pasture management didn't really matter because they'd say, hey, how could anyone rest a pasture that long, okay? And so the problem is that these long rest periods um, are longer than what you're gonna normally recommend for the health of that pasture as far as it regrowing back again really fast after it's been cut and also for the nutritional value. And you can see in this slide that these goats came in here the day before and they tramp and the stems of this grass were lignified enough, which that lignin, that fiber like that, isn't gonna be as digestible by the rumen. And they sort of knocked it all down and they broke out into a hay field that had been mowed two weeks earlier and grazed out there instead. Um, so there's still plenty of good blades and stuff on the grass, but that's just a trade-off that you have to remember. Um, that by doing these long rest periods, your pasture is gonna be pretty mature unless you can think of something to do. This is a study they did at West Virginia University with their organic sheep flock, where some of the animals were, um, some of the animals were rotated through the pasture so that they were on a paddock for three days and then it was rested for 57 days before they came back to that same paddock. And then the other sheep, were kept in a pasture for seven days and then did not return to that same pasture or paddock for 21 days. And what they found was that the animals where they practiced avoidance grade thing had half as many worm eggs, strongyle worm eggs. And they were able to market 83% of the lambs as organic versus in the other pasture, they had twice as many worm, worms and they had to, they had to deworm uh, 53 percent of the animals and lambs and so weren't able to market those as as um, as organic and the weight gains were also better on those ones that had the longer rest periods uh, probably because they had less of a parasite load so things you can do are there safe pastures that you can put your animals onto as the grazing season progresses do you have some brush pastures or do you have hay field regrowth, which we're lucky enough at our farm that that's what we have um, starting in July. You know, we can put the animals out on that July, August. Do you have pastures that your cattle and horses have been grazing that you can switch your sheep and goats with your horses and cattle? Do you have crop residues? Do you have annual pastures or, um, you know, there's some tall, very, very tall annuals that your animals can graze. Um, or can you disrupt the worm cycle by mowing the pasture extremely short at the beginning of the rest period? Uh, if you've got a 60 day rest period, you know, you can mow it real short and it doesn't matter that that pasture is gonna take a long time to grow back. Uh, can you graze another species like horses or cattle there during the rest period? And that's what we do at our farm. We bring our horses onto the pasture about 30 days after the, after the goats have gone through it and have them graze it. Or can you harvest the hay crop or baleage, you know, green chop off of that pasture before you resume grazing? 
Um, and then, like I said, you can go into some browse, um, but the only problem in New York with browse is that our deer worm um, have a lot of, our, our deer, our white-tailed deer, a lot of them have, have deer worm. Um, but keep in mind that 80% of the worms live in that first two inches of vegetation. Uh, deer worm, unfortunately, the brush snails that have deer worm um, often can climb two feet up in the brush. And then there have been some studies suggesting that grazing high tannin forages uh, may reduce the effects of um, barber pole worm. Okay. And can you control your barnyard effect? Um, so barnyards are really any area you have on the farm that has good forage on it that the animals can eat and unfortunately also has a high amount of manure on it, which means it's got a high amount of contamination with worm eggs. And these barnyards or these pastures that are often uh, the pasture you used over the winter because it was right against the barn or the one you used for lambing because it was right against the barn. These, unfortunately, these barnyards are little pastures that you're not rotate that you didn't rotate can contribute greatly to herd contamination with internal parasites. Um, Keep in mind that rotational grazing in the spring, even if you can't practice these long rest periods of 60 days to 105 days, still can help reduce this barnyard effect and delay the onset of summer parasite problems. And we did a study where we took three farms in Vermont and one of those farms didn't rotate at all. They just continually grazed a really huge pasture. And then we did the same thing in New York. We took three farms and one of the farms continually grazed a really, really large pasture versus the other two farms on each state uh, rotated their pastures, but they weren't able to do these 60 day rest periods. They did shorter rest periods than that. And by July, you can see that the, um, that rotating one and rotating two herds, they had, a, they had a lot of worms. They had like 3,500 or 2,000 worm eggs. And those farms at that point switched those animals onto hay fields or onto uh, brush pastures or pastures their cattle or cattle had been on or their horses. Um, so they did have worms and it was a good time to move them. But if you look at that pasture that was doing continual, continuous grazing, and this happened at both farms, they had 20, they had almost 24,000 worm eggs per gram or per gram, and they were losing goat kids. Uh, two worms. They were they were dying from the worms. And so even if you can't do those long rest periods, rotations can still help you. Some options to help reduce barnyard effect are laying down gravel or concrete or spraying with herbicides in those barnyards, clawing off access to the barnyard. If you bring your animals in at night, just make it so that they can't go into those barnyards. Make the barnyard small enough that there's no real forage growing in them to tempt the animals or put in lanes or leave your animals out 24 seven. No, okay. Um, in the spring, we often see a rise in barber pole worm populations. And this is because the barber pole worm has generally overwintered as these dormant, you know, hibernating L4 larva in the host animals and the goats and sheep. And it gets two, it gets a couple of different triggers letting it know that springtime has arrived. One, if your animals are giving birth, your sheep and goat, your does and your ewes uh, uh, put out estrogen um, as they're getting ready to give birth. And these and the female worms have uh, estrogen receptors. So they go, whoa, worming's going, or lambing and kidding are going on. And this is a great time for me to stop being an L4 larva and become an adult worm. Also, um, they have, they can tell, they can, um, they can measure, they, they're able to get a trigger of the amount of melanoma in those sheep and goats. And so they're able to tell that the day length is changing, that the days are getting longer um, and that can help them. Keep in mind also that the immune system in your goats and sheep is gonna be, is compromised by parturusum and it's also compromised by illness, regardless of the time of year. And when your the immune system is compromised, the L4 larva also gets a trigger that the immune system is comp compromised and will become break its dormancy then as well. 
And the same phenomena occurs in other strongyle worms, but not to the extent that it does in barber pole worm. Okay. This was a study um, at, uh, they did at University of Maine with their Icelandic sheep, uh, where they had the sheep in the barn. Um, and then they looked at different ways to control the, the, the spring rise of, um, of worms. And what they did is the blue line here are ewes that went out to pasture May 15th. So at this farm, they went out right when the spring rise was at its peak. The animals, I believe, were lambing in March and the, the L4 had become, the, they were, had become adults and the eggs from these larvae that had, from these worms that originally had been born in 2014, these eggs were peaking at a, the population of eggs was peaking right about May 15th when these animals were sent out to pasture versus the red line is sheep that they kept in the barn for another month and didn't let them go out to pasture until June 15th. And by that time, um, they were cleaning the barn of manure. You know, they were cleaning the manure out of the barn. And by that time, these, L, these L4 larvae that had become adults had really stopped a lot, most of their egg laying. Their population had gone way down by that. And what they found is that the ones that went out May 15th, um, they reinfected, their, they reinfected the pasture with, with eggs really quickly. And their worm eggs were really high by June 15th. And they actually needed to deworm their lambs uh, by then, uh, the lambs that were at these ewe sides. Versus the other ones, because they went out after this rise, after the rise was over, and once the egg count was down quite low, the pasture took a lot longer to get infected and really didn't get infected until mid-June, I mean mid-August, and then the cold weather arrived. So they didn't have to worm, deworm most of those lambs. Okay, but unfortunately, of course, they lost a whole month of grazing forage. And I'm not sure how many farmers are going to be willing to keep their animals in the barn and feed them hay for an extra month. Um, I'm now going to switch over to talking about the immune, immune response that animals have to worms. And keep in mind that good nutrition stimulates the immune system. And vitamins such as or minerals such as selenium, copper, and zinc are all involved, very tightly involved in, in, the, in having a good working immune system. And vitamins such as vitamin E are also really important. So one thing you can do is make sure that your animals are getting a sufficient amount of these vitamin, of their trace minerals and of vitamin E. Uh, we already talked about how lactating or late pregnancy animals generally don't have, their immune system is, is compromised. And so you can get this spring rise in worm egg hatching because of the L4 larva breaking dormancy and becoming adults. But what they've found is that if you have diets that contain 130% of the daily crude protein requirements for late pregnancy use, that this will actually reduce that flush of egg laying or it will reduce that spring rise because this extra crude protein helps the immune system mount an attack, okay? And they haven't done these experiments with goats, but the general thought is that it also helps with goats. So that's why one reason, one of many reasons to consider giving your animals more protein in late pregnancy than the, than the basic requirements for late pregnancy sheep or goats, okay? Um, the last um, National Re uh, Resource Council recommendations for goats and sheep were done in 2007. And at that time, they upped the requirement for vitamin E for sheep and goats quite a lot. And so University of Rhode Island did a study where they compared the old requirements to these newer requirements, these 2007 requirements. And they took lambs that they had weaned and for their creep feed, they added five international units of vitamin E per kilogram of live weight to the creep feed uh, for half the lambs. And the other half of the lambs, they gave the new requirements, uh, twice as much vitamin E. And, um, and then they artificially infected the lambs with barbapole worm larvae. And they found that the ones that had the higher 
level of vitamin E in their creek feed had half as many had half as many worm eggs, uh, uh, shed half as many worm eggs. Okay, so that really helps to emphasize the importance of vitamin E. Um, when it comes to genetic resistance to worms, um, keep in mind that yes, um, that your sheep and goats, not only are they infect, affected by the environment, but they're also affected by the genetics they've inherited. And the heritability for genetic resistance to strong jaw worms is actually very similar to the heritability for milk yield. Um, when it, um, and so just the way they've made lots of progress with milk yield and dairy cattle, we could, if we put our mind to it, put a lot of, uh, do a lot of improvement for genetic resistance to strong gyle worms in our sheep and goats. Just like with milk yield, it does require lots of records. Uh, you would often be comparing the fecal egg count for offspring of different sires. Um, and if you have a meat goat or a meat sheep farm, you can enroll in the National Sheep Improvement Program's on-farm genetic evaluation program. And they look at two traits for worms. Um, these are strongyle worms they're looking at, not strongyloides and not the, not the protozoa coccidia. They're just looking at strongyle worms. And they look at the count at weaning and then also the count about 30 to 60 days after weaning and then send out genetic proofs for sires and dams uh, based, based on the results of their offspring. And so that is something you can consider joining. Okay, so what is the mechanism of biological resistance of your sheep and goats to barbacol worm? Um, the animal's immune system has to do two, two things. It has to recognize that it's gotten a parasite infection. So it has to recognize that it's been infected with barber pole worm and how quickly this occurs varies between breeds and individuals. And it has to mount an effective response. And this effectiveness also varies between breeds and individuals. This is a study. Um, that was done at West Virginia University where they compared St. Croix sheep to Suffolk sheep, uh, Suffolk crossbred sheep. And uh, they, you can look at this chart down, these charts down here. And the green line is animals that had been artificially uh, infected with barber pole worm previously, and then given a dewormer or something to get rid of that infection. And then they're being infected a second time now. The red line is animals that are being infected for the first time. Um, and then the blue line is animals that aren't being infected at all. And that was sort of to make sure that there was no other way that they were getting barber pole worm. And if you look at the St. Croix sheep, you can see that the sheep that had been previously infected, um, as soon as they got infected again, they were able to keep that, those, that um, barber bowl worm infection down completely. There were no eggs shed. Versus when you look at the Suffolk sheep, that green line went back up at about two weeks after they were infected. The line went back up and they did, they did show an immune response when they got about 3000 worm eggs per gram and it did go down, but then after six weeks, it's starting to go back again. For the animals infected for the first time ever, uh, two weeks after they had been infected, they started hatching out worm eggs, or they started, the, started producing worm eggs in the feces. Um, you know, they had enough adult worms to do that. And the St. Croix sheep realized that about 2,500 worm eggs or so, that, hey, I've been infected. And they mounted an immune response and brought the worm load back down again by five weeks of an, after infection. Versus the Suffolk sheep, it took them until they were about 7,000 worm eggs to realize that they had been infected. And then they mounted an immune response, but it was somewhat short-lived. By six weeks, they were starting to go back up again. And if we look at the macrophages that are attacking the worms, you can see that they've attacked the St. Croix, the Saint, they've attacked this barber pole worm here in the abomasum or actually I think this is more in a Petri dish. Um, and that worm isn't able to move around much at all. Uh, versus if you look at this prime suffix, that even though the macrophagia have attacked it, that worm is still able to move around a lot. And so if 
probably could still suck blood from the lining of the Ava Mesa. Okay. Um, traditional parasite control uh, in the 70s and 80s sort of planned that you were going to maximize your parasite control, and that would maximize the production from your animals and the health of your animal. And you would deworm the herd regularly. If your dewormer stopped working, there'd be a new dewormer showing up. And you would rotate your dewormers maybe during the year or every other year or something. And you would move the flock onto a clean pasture at the time you dewormed them uh, so that those, those eggs that were hatched, you know, that day or two before that uh, adult worm died wouldn't be contaminating your, your, your pasture. Okay, all of these practices pro unfortunately promoted dewormer resistance to the barber pole worm. Uh, because of its heavy, being a heavy egg layer and it having a short generation interval. And it's now a major problem throughout the US. And this was a study we did here at Cornell in 2007, where we uh, sampled goats at a bunch of Nor New York farms and also some Pennsylvania farms over the border from Elmira and stuff. And we already found in 2007 that about half the, half the herds were already showing a severe resistance to safeguard. And those red checkered ones mean that when you gave the dewormer, it killed off 100% of those worm eggs, or that two weeks later, all the adult worms were killed off because the worm eggs per gram dropped to zero. Unfortunately, it, in that blue group, it's only killing off about 60% uh, of the worms or le less, um, and when you looked at the ivermectin, the results weren't quite as bad. It was killing off about one, about one third of the farms were showing already a severe resistance to ivermectin. And unfortunately, my farm is that number one farm there where it's saying it's close to negative 10, which means that there were more worm, egg, worm eggs in the feces 10 days or 14 days after deworming with ivermectin than there had been uh, when they first dewormed with the ivermectin. So di the ivermectin was essentially like candy. Um, so the traditional leads to dewormer resistance because it's destroying the refugia. And the refugia is just a fancy name for propor the proportion of the worm population that has not been exposed to the dewormer treatment. And it's in ref refuge from the dewormer. So it would include the worms and untreated animals and also the eggs and larvae that were already on the pasture before treatment. So the worms, and you know, they might have survived from the previous time your goats and sheep were out on that pasture. Um, unfortunately, because most of us have dewormed in the past, most of our worm populations have at some point been exposed to worms. Okay, but hopefully you've got this pool of genes that's sensitive to the dewormer. Okay, that hasn't directly experienced the dewormer before. And I'll show you how this can help dilute the genes that are resistant to the dewormer. Okay, so you have your susceptible parents and your resistant parents, you give them the dewormer and the only animals that, the only worms that survive after you give them the dewormer treatment are the, adult, are the, are the resistant worms. And so they mate together, you know, they mate with each other and put out worm eggs, and the worm eggs they're putting out are, are all resistant to this dewormer for the most part, okay? Um, and I'll go through that a little bit more in a little while, but first I'm gonna talk about effective use of dewormers. And few of your dewormers, as Betsy said, are approved for use in goats, okay? Um, we normally recommend, because goats have a fatter race rate of passage of chemicals through their bodies, um, they have a rat, rat, fat, faster rate of digestion, and they have larger livers than, um, than your sheep or cattle for their, for their me metabolic size. We usually recommend that you give them one and a half to twice the sheep or the cattle dose per pound live weight, okay, when deworming them. And you'll wanna talk with your veterinarian. In sheep and goats, you don't want the dewormer to linger in a low amount for a long period of time. So because of that, we don't recommend using poron dewormers. And we also don't recommend giving the dewormer as an injection, okay? Because it lingers then 
as a low amount in the animal and, and can help build up uh, dewormer resistance. Uh, instead, we want you to give it orally at the back of the back behind the tongue. If it goes too close to the front of the mouth, the animal can have a gag effect, which will send it to the true stomach. Um, and um, and it'll break down and that truth in the true stomach and the acidity of the true stomach, the dewormer is going to break down faster. And then always observe the proper withdrawal period. Um, and the trouble with dewormers in your feed, like that positive uh, goat pellet, is if you have a lot of animals, it's very hard to make sure that they all got the same amount of dosage in their feed or water. Uh, if you've just got a couple of dairy goats and they're jumping onto a milk stand and you're making sure that they eat it all while they're on the milk stand, you know, that they then you can control more the amount and make sure that everyone got the right amount. Okay. Um, you can increase the effectiveness of a dewormer once you're starting to see resistance by holding your animals off of feed for 16 hours and then deworming them and keeping them off of feed for 12 more hours. Obviously, you wouldn't want to do this to a late pregnancy you or doe because it could easily push her into ketosis. You're not going to want to fast fast a late pregnancy animal. Also, for your ben, for those white um, paste dewormers, deworming them twice, 12 hours apart. So you would give them the full dose, 12 hours apart, uh, can be very effective. And then you can deworm them on the. Another thing you can do is deworm on the same day with two dewormers. You don't mix the two dewormers together. You give them one and then you give them the other uh, with two dewormers from two different uh, families of deworm. And you would only, uh, you would know, only do this if you're selectively deworming. You wouldn't do this if you're deworming the whole herd because you're just going to build up resistance even faster if you're doing it for the whole herd, uh, giving them those two dewormers. Um, there have been a lot of studies that have shown that targeted selective deworming is going to prolong your dewormer efficiency, uh, uh, if, is, is going to uh, de uh, delay that dewormer resistance. And um, this is, and it's, keep in mind that your parasites aren't equally distributed in all individuals. You've got that bell-shaped curve, just the way you do with milk yield. Some animals are more resistant than other animals. About 20 to 30% of your sheep and goats in a flock will harbor about 80% of the worms. And those 20 or 30% are gonna be responsible for most of the egg output and most of the pasture contamination. So you just need to deworm those animals, not the entire flock. Okay, and so here's an example in a goat herd. Each one of these pink bars is an individual goat and one third of the goats are carrying 80% of the worms. Okay, so if you could deworm that one third of the goats, it would, um, it would, it would really cut down on your pasture contamination. Okay, and so after you've dewormed that one third of the goats and you put to send your animals out to the next grazing paddock, one third of these goats have these highly resistant genes to, uh, to barber pole worm. But the rest of your goats, the rest of the eggs that are being pooped out haven't been selected in this generation for dewormer resistance to whatever dewormer you used. And so they're gonna, you know, at, your animal's gonna go out in that pasture and it's gonna be taking a bite of, of, of L3 larvae that are highly resistant and then lots of bites of L3 larvae that haven't been exposed, been exposed to that dewormer this generation. And so once they're inside the animal and they're crossbreeding, you have a lot more chance of those resistant genes being diluted in the dilute, diluted in that general worm population inside your animal. Okay. So how do you determine who to deworm? You can do fecal egg counts, like you know that example that I showed you there, but it's costly and very time consuming. Even if you do your own fecal egg counts, it's time consuming to do them. And it also doesn't identify animals that have a low tolerance to barber pole worm, but for some reason or other, aren't shedding a lot of eggs. Maybe they have di diarrhea from other worms and it's diluting their eggs. And you can also look at visual cues or production records to get an idea. And what we usually say is use a five point check, okay? 
And you want to be sure to include FAMACHA in your five point check uh, because FAMACHA is going to monitor an anemia, and anemia is the main sign that you're going to have a barbapol worm. Um, and otherwise, the other things your five point check is going to can include are things like diarrhea and poor, poor growth. And the FAMACHA system was developed in South Africa because of the severe um, dewormer resistance they were experiencing there in their sheep and goats. And it's a method of selective deworming that really cuts down on the number of dewormings given to individual animals in an entire flock, okay? Rather than deworming all the animals every six weeks, only some animals are gonna be repeatedly dewormed. And it's, significant, it's been shown in studies to significantly decrease the rate of development of dewormer resistance. Here's an example five point check that we often use in, North, in the Northeast US. So you'll look at the body condition of the animal. Uh, you might look at the weight gain if you've got those recorded. You might see what, which lambs aren't growing as well, as, haven't grown as well uh, these last two weeks compared to the other lambs in your herd in your flock and you look at the hair coat on the animals, is it rough or is it nice and shiny? You'd look at the DAG score, which is what the feces looks like. Is it diarrhea or if it's sperm? Um, it, we said FAMACHA is a way to look at how anemic the animal is. Also how well the animal moves. Is the animal lagging behind the other animals? Just like an anemic person, that animal is gonna tend to lag behind the others as they move from pasture to the pasture. And then you'd look to see if a bottle jaw is present um, or not. Um, and all of these things, you may, you may say that if it's got any one of these things, you're going to deworm it. Um, bottle jaw can be caused by other things as well, like we talked about liver fluke. Um, but you'll look and see, does it have one of these criteria? And in that case, should it be dewormed? A little bit more talking about famacha. It screens for anemia, so it's really only good when it comes to strongyle worms on the barber pole worm, which is the only one of your strongyle worms that really causes a neat, severe anemia. And you're gonna look at the color of the membrane inside the lower eyelid. You push down on the upper eye, eyelid, so you're pushing the eye into the eye socket. That causes that membrane to push out on the lower eyelid, so it's really easy for you to see it there. It pops out. And you're gonna treat your adults at scores four and five and your lambs and kids at scores three, four, and five. Um, and you'll also use other things to help you make your decisions like that five point check. And you want, don't wanna count only on this. Uh, it needs to be um, on this. Uh, it is fairly labor intensive and stuff, but you'll wanna combine it with other management practices as well. Uh, for accuracy, you're supposed to do FAMACHA in the sunlight. And obviously in New York, we don't always have very bright sunlight. If you are doing it in, barn, in a barn, a 500 watt uh, quartz work light uh, will be sufficient enough light. Or if you've got a skylight or you're doing it near a window, right by a window in your barn, that will also help with the lighting. Okay, And we do it at least every two weeks during the grazing season. Uh, you can often get away with doing it more like once a month during the winter. Um, and, um, and you want to take a certification course, which is what you guys are doing right now for the most part. And be aware that there's other causes of anemia, such as sucking lice, liver flukes, different diseases, etc. cetera. Uh, also other causes of red membranes. If your animal's just been running in the wind, and there's a lot of dust, or if your animal's running a high fever for some reason, that can also make the membranes higher. Okay. If there, ideally, there's going to be less than 10% of your animals in categories four and five, five. So you're going to treat the fours and fives in that case with an effective dewormer, uh, which is a good reason to be doing fecal egg counts and finding out what dewormers do work on your farm by comparing uh, fecal egg counts before and after deworming, you know, two weeks after deworming versus right at deworming. And you're gonna have to decide whether to do your threes or not, okay? And then you're gonna re-example your herd two weeks later. The trouble is that if greater than 10% of your flock or herd is in categories four and five, 
you're gonna deworm the threes anyway. Normally in the previous slide, you wouldn't be deworming the threes unless they were lambs or kids, or they were heavily milking sheep or goats, or they were uh, sheep or goats with kids at their side. You know, um, if they were dry animals, you wouldn't be treating those threes. But now we're talking about treating all the threes, all the adult three animals as well, as well. So you're gonna be deworming a lot more of your animals now. So you unfortunately have compromised some of the goals of FAMACHA. Okay, so in that case, you would start checking your animals once a week. And it's really important not to let your, you know, a lot of people, they do FAMACHA, but they do it once a month or once every two months. So great, they catch animals and keep them from dying but almost all their animals need deworming at that time. So they didn't get rid of the pasture contamination. So I don't know how to stress that this is time consuming. You need to do it at least every two weeks during the grazing season, okay. And again, I already mentioned uh, when you would wanna treat the threes. If they're young animals, thin, vulnerable animals, thin, uh, thin animals or if greater than 10% of the herd or flock is in category four or five. If you're down to one effective drug, you might consider losing your le using your less effective drugs on your category three animals or using a single dewormer on them and using two dewormers on your fours and five on your animals that are scoring four and five. Don't buy resistant worms, okay? All your new additions to your herd should be aggressively, should be quarantined and aggressively dewormed. And we generally recommend that you deworm them with all three dewormer classes or families. And again, don't mix them to together, mix them, give them separately on the same day. And then keep your animals in quarantine for at least two weeks. Don't put their manure out on your pasture because that manure is gonna have eggs in it that were resistant to both of those or to all three of those dewormers. So those are super worms. Instead, compost those worms or put them in your garden or something. And if possible, perform fecal egg counts to confirm that you've gotten rid of most, most or all your worms. Okay, so that's nine o'clock. I'm gonna go ahead and continue on with part three with what's in our future. And this is gonna take about 15 minutes, I believe. And there's five different things I'm gonna talk about and where these five things are at currently, okay? Okay, so the first of these is a fecal fungus um, called Dunningtonian flagrass grass. And it's marketed right now in one form by Premier. You can also order it, um, order, order the other form of it as well. And there are about 100 species of nematode eating fungi, okay? And uh, many of them are found in livestock feces because they, you know, nature knows that there's lots of eggs in that feces that are gonna hatch out and become worms. And so denatonium uh, actually, uh, it hatches out in that feces along with those worms. And it, uh, it, las it essentially lassoes those worms those L2, one and L2 larva and gobbles them up. And there's two products that's, that are made by International Animal Health that are approved in the United States. One's BioWorma, and this is the one that you have to contact International Animal Health to order it directly from them. And that one, uh, your meal can order it or you can order it to be top dressed or incorporated into a feed. And University of Rhode Island is looking at what happens if you mix that into a minerals into your salt. Um, how effective is it? Can you mix it into 50 pounds of salt and then give it every day after that? Or do you have to mix it in every single day is one of the things they're looking at. And then uh, Levamol is the one that's marketed by uh, Premier. And this is a feed supplement. It's, our, it's a pelleted feed supplement or it's a feed, I don't know actually if it's pelleted. Um, but it's a feed supplement that you can feed your animals while they're out on pasture and, and they can eat it. Okay, uh, so, so the bioworma you would need to use for your grass-fed animals because I think the level mall has more in it than just alfalfa meal. Okay, and both of these have been approved for organic farms in Australia and they are seeking approval for organic farms in the United States. 
So the, spore, the fungal spores survive passage through the digestive tract. They don't kill the animal while they're in the digestive tract. They remain spores in the digestive tract. Um, then they germinate and it's in the feces that they attack. And the livestock has to eat the spores uh, daily, though they're doing testing right now. Um, there, there are tests going on by the American researchers with the American Consortium right now to see if you could give it every other day or every third day and still have it be as effective. It is very costly. I think it costs about 50 cents a day. So it's almost like feeding, going ahead and feeding your animals hay instead of having them out on pasture. There have been some palatability issues with it, though normally after the first few days, your animals start, start going ahead and eating it, okay? Uh, there was a vaccine that was developed in Australia. It's unlikely to be, uh, to be offered in the United States, in part because they still can't synthesize the antigen. Uh, for barber pole worm. Instead, what they're having to do is they're having to harvest the antigen by centrifuging worms from lambs and sheep or from sheep that they've slaughtered in slaughterhouses in Australia. And then they harvest the antigen from those worms. So they get, you know, some of the worms that come into those slaughterhouses are heavily parasitized and they're able to centrifuge those worms and get that antigen. And they um, become more effective at how they're harvested them so that they can now get enough antigen from one sheep to vaccinate 100 sheep, okay? Versus before they used to have to slaughter a lot more sheep. The vaccine's called Barberbeck. Barber it did not function that reliably in goats, so it did not get licensed for goat, was unable to get licensed for goats in Australia. And it requires five injections. After the first three primers, your animals do have some temporary um, uh, resistance to barber pole worm. And then you need to give two more boosters six weeks apart. So the idea in Australia was that you would give this to lambs. You wouldn't use this in older animals, where, in mature animals, where you hope that they have built up resistance on their, you know, have more resistance than lambs and lambs would have. Okay, but again, as I said, right now, it's very doubtful it'll come to the US or, or Canada. Canada is trying to get it and is working with, um, with some researchers in the US to try, you know, or marketers in the US to see if both the US and Canada can get it. But it's less likely because it's fairly expensive. It's not that infected, effective in goats. Um, and so that's sort of the status on it. And then we have copper oxide wire particles. And you need to keep in mind that the way this works is it only works on worms that, strongyle worms that are in the true stomach or in the abomasum. So that means that it would only work on barber pole worm or on the brown stomach worm. And unfortunately, it does not work on the brown stomach worm because we talked about how the brown stomach worm damages the glands of the true stomach. And when it damages those glands, it damages the production of the gastric juices. And this means that the pH of the true stomach be, uh, does not get as acidic as it should, as, it, as the true stomach normally would. And what they found is the copper oxide wire particles dissolve in the true stomach because of those gastric juices, because of the acidity of the true stomach. That's why it doesn't work if it lodges, if these uh, wire particles lodge in the rumen. The rumen's not acidic enough to, 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 um, to dissolve them. And so if your animal has a heavy infection of brown stomach worm, the copper oxide wire particles will not dissolve in the true stomach and you won't get, um, you, won't get you, you won't be able to get this copper release. So the copper won't, um, work as a supplement for your animal if you're trying to supplement the animal's copper. And it also won't work to kill your barber pole worm because it's not dissolving. And generally what we're hoping for is that it dissolves and it causes lesions on the barber pole worm and makes the worm weaker and more susceptible to the immune system attacking it. And also just more susceptible to dying and not laying a lot of eggs. And we also believe 
that if your animals are a little deficient in copper, that it gives your animals a little bit of a copper boost and also helps your animal, helps, helps the immune system be more, function more. Now you cannot, you all, you all are probably aware that sheep are very susceptible to copper poisoning. And so we found that this only, that when this works, it works at very low dosages. And I'll talk about that a little later. Okay, that the dosages are low enough that unless you're giving your sheep other sources of copper, it's usually safe at the very low dosages you want to give it. Okay, and here's Betsy giving some. Okay, so we did studies with about, I don't know, at least 12 farms, maybe 16 farms, looking at copper in the Northeast US. And we found that the copper oxide wire particles didn't work as effectively as effectively or abruptly as chemical dewormers, unless you had a lot of resistance already to that chemical dewormer. We found that in farms where it worked, it worked in, your, in the flock at 0.5 grams per head dosages when it came to lambs. That you, those dosages were just as, as effective as one gram dosages. On goats, it seemed like possibly that slightly higher dose, that one gram dosage might be more effective. But in all the lamb trials, if it was gonna work, it was gonna work at 0.5 grams, okay? And they've done studies in the Southeast US where they've given 0.5 gram dosages to lambs a few times over the grazing season without experiencing any toxicity. Do keep in mind that the Cornell Diagnostic Diag or Veterinary Diagnostic Lab has done necropsies on lambs that died from copper poisoning at as low as two gram dosages. And often when you go to buy it, you can only buy the dosages at two grams or higher. And you never wanna give a sheep or goat the high dosages that they have for cattle, which I think for calves, it's the nine gram dose and you wanna avoid doing that. You wanna, uh, goats you can get away usually with that two gram goat dosage. And on adult sheep, they'll sometimes use that two gram dosage, but that 0.5 is one of what you wanna use in lambs, okay. And though it has a very, it did have a very effective long-term impact at the Extension Learning Farm in St. Lawrence County for over three years of testing, okay. But on our other farms, it had a short-term effect. Um, and in some farms, it was kind of totally ineffective, okay. And why did the dose, why did the results vary across farms? It could be that the diet of the animals Maybe the true stomach of milk-fed lambs or kids might be more acidic than that of lambs and kids that are getting a lot of grain. Um, the timing of the dosage in relation to the timing of infection, we found that it seemed to work best. And, and then also the exposure of the worms before. Um, they did some studies in the Southeast US where it seemed like just like with regular dewormers, animals could, uh, worms, barber pole worms could become more and more resistant to, to, the, to the copper, okay? So if you've been giving your animals a lot of copper already, it may not work as well. In our studies, it seemed to work best when the animals already had some barber pole worm load when they were first dosed, okay? Rather than, hey, they got their, they were, they got their dosage of barber pole worms six weeks later, you know? It also seemed to work best when it was given two weeks pre-weaning, uh, but it also did work post-weaning, okay? And then it also worked, seemed to work best when animals weren't already consuming a large quantity of grain. Um, and it may be that it works be well before weaning or before animals are eating a lot of hay or grain because it doesn't accidentally lodge in the rumen, uh, maybe because the animals aren't eating as much grass and grain. Instead, it's able to go directly to the true stomach. We're not sure, okay? We need more controlled studies looking at why we have this effect differ so much from farm to farm. So if you use copper oxide wire particles, be sure to check your animals and see, um, you know, do a check on them, a fecal egg count on them 14 days later to see if your flock is one of those flocks where it's effective or if your flock is one of those flocks where it's not very effective. It, they've also found that grazing a forage legume, Cerasia lespedisa in the Southeast US um, uh, appeared to really 
uh, cut down on the barber pole worm. It seemed to reduce the hatching of viable eggs. And it also seemed to inhibit that L4-3 larva becoming an L4 larva and getting rid of that sheath that's covering its mouth. It has to be, get rid of that sheath in order to suck blood. But unfortunately, Cerecia lespedeza is not winter hardy in the Northeast US, uh, but bird's foot trefoil is. So we did do a bunch of studies with bird's foot trefoil. Uh, and the thought is that it's supposed to be the condensed tannins, particularly condensed tannins in the Cerecia lespedeza. Uh, that caused, um, caused, caused these uh, problems for the barber pole worm. Um, not all tannins seem to work. Um, they haven't had really good luck with oak or with grape pulp in general. They seem to have promising results with cranberry leaves at University of Rhode Island, but then when they did further studies, it didn't seem to bear it out. In the Southeast US, they've done some studies with ground pine bark where it seemed to help. Um, it's really hard to know. In our studies, and we're still doing some later studies right now, we did find that animals that got the bird's foot trefoil versus conventional pastures uh, appeared to be more resilient as far as to barber pole worm. As far as they seem to have better homocha scores, they seem to gain weight better. Um, there has been some thought that there might be other compounds in bird's foot trefoil besides the condensed tannins that help to boost their immune system. Uh, bird's foot trefoil, because of the high tannins in it, should have a more bypass protein. And there's been studies that have seemed to show that uh, rumen bypass protein, a certain um, a, a higher percentage than is normally required for the animal, can help to boost the immune system. Uh, so we did tend to get better for matcha scores. We also found that grass-fed lambs and kids that were growing on lush bird's foot trefoil pastures grew better uh, for the most part than ones that were grazing control pastures, but we couldn't rule out nutrition. In a lot of these cases, the control pastures didn't have nearly as much crude protein as the bird's foot pastures. The bird's foot pastures were often 18 to 20% crude protein, so really high in protein. And, um, so, so in these later studies, we were supposed to look at nutrition, but they didn't work out all that well. And, and we often had that same problem that the control pastures weren't as nutritious. If you are a grass-fed farm, we did find that um, animals grew really well on the birds, but trefoil pastures. They often gained a third to up to close to a half a pound of weight gain a day on those pastures. And we also found that, copper, that if you gave copper wire particles and, and bird's foot trefoil, they seemed to work together and to be more effective and that they didn't cancel each other out. So whatever's causing one to be effective wasn't necessarily what was causing the other one to be effective, okay? Uh, the last thing I'm gonna discuss is a crystal protein, Cry5b, that is made by the soil bacteria Bacillus thuringiensis. And some of you, if you do organic farming or you have a vegetable garden, have used Bacillus thuringiensis before. It's highly effective against uh, other worms, such as the tomato uh, hornworm or the corn earworm. Um, unfortunately, if you give Bacillus thuringiensis to your sheep or goat, it's denatured in the rumen. So it doesn't help to just give it to your sheep or goat. Um, and when they tried to isolate out the cry proteins from the bacillus thur thuringiensis and give them to the um, barber pole worm, egg worms, or give them to the sheep and goats, it was the same thing. It did. It wasn't stable in the in the ruminant in, stable in the ruminant digestive tract. However, they've discovered that if they um, take those cry five B crystals and they put them inside dead Bt cell walls that they are able to pass through the, um, through the rumen and they, reduce the, and they reduce the fecal egg counts by 90%. So they seem to really affect the viability of the eggs. They also found that they seem to kill off the adult worms, particularly the adult female worms within the animal. Uh, they, female worms were killed off about 96% and males, it was a lot less. So about 72% of the adult worms in the animal were killed off. 
and it seems to be fairly cheap compared to the vaccine. And so there's further testing going on at University of Rhode Island. I think Kentucky is looking at it with horse, with worms and horses. Um, and, um, and we'll see how it works out. Um, they're, right now they've got high hopes for it. It probably wouldn't be approved for organic because they're having to use uh, gene therapy to, to get those, um, to isolate out those cry 5B crystals and inject them into the dead BT cell walls. And so I thank you all for putting up with this long, long presentation. And are there any questions? And I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share now. Um, okay. And so if anyone's still alive out there, uh, we'll be happy to have some questions. They're mostly still there. I think maybe the best thing might be to chat in your questions and then I'll read them. Uh, which there might be one there now, hang on. Oh, thank you. Someone had a joke, had a joke, or no? Oh, no, <laughs> no, that's Olivia talking about killing her alpaca, the deer worm. Yep, it, it's, um, we gave you a lot of information. Like I said, it wouldn't hurt to watch the one uh, again, you know, in a week or two when you've digested a little of this uh, to get some of the basics, you know, sort of wraps, uh, summarizes what we were talking about in great detail at the uh, Wormex. I will send that link. And as well as the Wormex one, we recorded this one, correct? And yes. then also, like I said, Cornell does have a website called the Cornell Small Ruminant parasite website, parasite research website. And if you go to that and look on the ed education page, some of these PowerPoints are there that you can just look at in your own, you know, at your own, own sweet time. I think the ones we did in 2019 are there. And many of the tables that Betsy's gonna be giving you are there as well. So there's a question here from Daniel that says, can Belbazin be used in pregnant use after the first month? Uh, after the first trimester, it would be. And, and I would talk with your veterinarian about it um, because when the, when the complaints first came out, it, it was talking about it anytime during pregnancy. In truth, um, abort abortions in early in, are very common in the first trimester. So we'll often say it's better to avoid most dewormers in the early trimester. That's why you'll often deworm your sheep and goats right as you're putting the ram in. Ram or buck in, you'll deworm them right then because it doesn't take much to make an animal abort in that first six week period. Uh, but, but yes, it's supposed to, it, technically it should be safe in that in, um, after that first six weeks, uh, the valve is in. But, and I know that, yeah, I don't know if you remember, but when you were having the fluke, the liver fluke problem, um, it was suggested that you use valvazin and, you, and the problem was that some of your animals were still in that we're pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the trouble, you know, they're infected with deer or, or with, with the deer fluke. You realize, you know, they're infected and they're also, you know, that's in the fall and you're breeding them right then. You know, and you're going, right. oh gosh. So that's where the Ivomec Plus would be the other alternative to use at that time and doesn't doesn't have that not being able to use. Right, which is not labeled for sheep, okay. by the way. Actually, so Daniel, Daniel's saying that the label says 30 days. And so, uh -huh. you know, I would, both Betsy and I would probably say, follow what the label says, you know. Uh, and, and, and if you want, talk to your vet as well, you know. But I certainly have used valvazin in later lactation for getting or later pregnancy for getting that an animal uh, was, you know, that I wasn't supposed to use it in pregnant animals and had them do fine um, when I've used it in late pregnancy sometimes. Yeah, so I, I also wanted to mention that there's quite a few people on this talk that are from areas that have a, a longer grazing system and maybe a little different weather pattern. So. I think we told you enough so you can make adjustments, but um, just keep that in mind when you're doing your strategies. Yeah. 
Good. Well, we must have worn them all out. <laughs> I think so. And, but and you I'm looking forward to seeing some of you the over the next few days uh, for the hands-on lab. And be sure you bring a fecal sample if you can get one from your uh, sheep and goats. I think I sent out instructions on that already. And wear clothes that you can wear in the barn since we will be handling animals. Prefer you not wear your barn boots from your barn, although we can disinfect them if they're rubber boots. And I do have plastic boots that we can put over. So um, we will do fecal egg counts. We're going to go over the pre the post test and talk a little bit about you know what you're doing on your farms. And we're going to do famacha in the barn with the animals. So and uh, and one thing I should add is I will be uh, Jan Leota and I will be doing a famacha certification workshop um, in gosh. Where's the next one at? Betsy, can you help me out? <laughs> it's in Herkimer, in Herkimer, the Tuesday after next Tuesday, September 28th. And then we're doing one in Jamestown, so way in Western New York um, on October 16th. And I would have a suspicion that you might be able to, if you, if you live in those local areas and you've taken this one, but need to do the hands-on part, you may be able to come and do the hands-on part there if you talk to those uh, extension educators directly. I believe Ashley McFarlane is hosting the one in Herkimer and Lisa Kapinski is hosting the one in Jamestown. Yeah, that would be great because there were some people from out of the area that were um, trying to get the hands-on part. That would be great. The other thing you can do is um, if you are in if you are on NSIP, uh, National Sheep Improvement Program, or if you raise breeding stock and have sheep or have a meat sheep, a meat goat breed, you can talk to NSIP. Are you, you can see if um, University of Rhode Island was offering free fecal sampling um, to a limited amount of farms in the Northeast US. If you are on NSIP or considering going on S NSIP, or sold a lot of breeding stock from your animals. Um, and I think, I, but I think mostly they were doing it to try and push people to become members of NSIP and start proving out their mm -hmm. sheep. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you all for also, hanging in there. Yeah, okay, thanks. And uh, feel free to email us questions and I will um, send the link to the recording and all of those things Todd and I talked about, the charts and the and, web pages and all that good stuff. And Amy, I do have one thing to say to you. Bob's story has retired as has Ray, Ray Kaplan. And so there's all sorts Ooh. of evil, evil going on right now. So oh, I okay. That, so that that's what the holdup is. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you for looking into that. Appreciate it. I, and I will know more in the next couple of weeks. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you, Tatiana. Okay, folks. Have a great night. Time to go have a bowl of ice cream, pet the cat, all that kind of thing. Uh, hopefully, you don't have to go back out to the barn. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, you can email us questions. We'd be happy to talk with you about it. And Betsy, thank you so much for putting this on. And I'm going to head home and go out to my pastors. <laughs> oh, you're going to be moving fence with a headlamp? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, I'm just going to be doing some feeding and watering out there. OK. Some very young animals out there, as well as needing to check the water. A little bit before bed goat therapy. Exactly. <laughs> So much good night. for being on Good night, everybody. And you'll stop the re recording or I will.